Steven, I'm at bowling and I just had a person walk up to me and ask me what my shirt meant. And I was like, photography. And they're like, oh, do you do this? I'm like, no, I make YouTube videos. And he's like, so are you like a macro or micro influencer? I was like, no, I'm a fucking global influencer. Is that a dick thing to say? Steven, isn't it funny how people just don't, they just can't grasp or wrap their head around what we do or people like us do for a living? I find it insanely hard to explain to people what I do for a living every single time. It, it's like the guy comes up to me, he looks at my shirt and he's like, I've always seen this. What does it mean? I tell him. Is it and sexual? They that, what is it? <laughs> but they always go, oh, like you shoot portraits or weddings. And of course, I'm like, weddings. No, but it, it, you know, I don't mean it that way. Like weddings are a bad thing to shoot, but no, I, I've been there, done that. But I'm like, no, I make I make YouTube videos about photography, and so are you macro or micro influencer? Are you like a macro or micro influencer? Nah, man. Are you regional, fucking, bro? Fucking global, bitch. <laughs> you know? Did you actually team, tell him that? I didn't say global, bitch. I said. <laughs> No, I'm fucking global influencer. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't do it in a dick way. Uh, and my teammate was like, that was a fucking dick way of saying it. And I'm like, no, no, man, it's just true. <laughs> uh, he was you, you remind me of uh, Ben Stiller in Dodgeball, like his attitude, <laughs> how cocky yeah, well, he is. Globo Jim, Steven. <laughs> That's right. Globo. No one makes me bleed my own blood exactly <laughs> yeah i mean yes i guess i have some ben stiller vibes that exist well ben stiller in that movie that character it's kind of true like people just don't they don't get it they don't they don't get it and it and it's it's all right in some situations but in others like i'm shooting the world series oh who are you shooting for me no no really like who are you shooting for i'm like yeah me like m me my brand you know, it's 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 like I, I have this thing that is bigger than these publications and it's hard for people to wrap their head around. Oh, it's not Sports Illustrated. It's not USA Today. I find the hardest thing to explain is that it's not just doing simple little YouTube videos like you don't just say I'm a YouTuber or I make YouTube videos because that could be anyone from making a you know quick video on their phone to having a high end production. So I always just kind of say like uh, I do video production, video producer, creative director, like all, I just throw all kinds of names out there just to make it easy for them to wrap their head around what I do but for the most part I just say I'm like a video editor video production but yeah I try not to say I make YouTube content because I feel like that really dumbs it down and people just automatically assume like you're some kid in the basement like making shitty videos well the, the first thing I say is I'm a photographer who so happens to make YouTube videos for a living and then it then the next question is can you make money at that that's always the next question and Yes, we made. I own how many properties, Stephen? Uh, I lost count a long time ago. Five, <laughs> five properties. Thanks, okay, YouTube. Okay, Ben Stiller. <laughs> Thanks, YouTube. But it's one of these ongoing things that that everybody always wants to know. How do you make money at it? Because I think the last thing you want to call yourself is an influencer, because that also could be portrayed as like, oh, you make little TikToks or like you know Instagram stories and promote products and blah blah blah. Well, that. Van Vanessa Joy just put out a video about her thoughts on on like people quitting YouTube and what it takes. She's like, oh, I just thought, you know, before I started doing YouTube that people just like, that's easy. Everybody and then thinks she, it. Yep. Then, then you do it and you're like, oh, wait, I can't just. I mean, when I first started, Stephen, I just made <laughs> videos and put them on the Internet just straight through. That's what I did. But that was also 14 years ago. I mean, hey, it's literally a full time job for all three of us. And we never, ever have downtime. Like we're never caught up. We're always on to the next thing before we even finish the last thing. So that's self-imposed. I mean, part of that's self-imposed for sure. But, you know, to try and keep doing two, three videos a week is and, and most of our videos are 20, 25 minutes these days. You know, it's not five minutes anymore. And there's a ton of B-roll and photos to show and all that kind of stuff. It takes a yeah. lot of time. I, I can't imagine someone like Vanessa Joy, how she does it because she's a mother. She's a photographer with a full time business that alone takes up a ton of time and then trying to do all the YouTube content around that on top of it. It's tough. She does it different than us. Uh, she does a lot of batching, like film 12 videos in a day and oh, then, oh, okay. and then, and then send it out to editor, like uh, certain editors online that do a specific job, but I don't, it's not how we want to do things. I didn't realize she's not 
editing them as well in house and all of that. I, I didn't really. She outsources well, some of a lot the of stuff that. her husband does. He's okay. an editor, and which is very helpful. But oh, he's yeah, also sure. busy and successful as a as a creator, as uh, not a online creator, but as an actual shooter. Um, it takes a lot a of time, editor. though, a lot of time and effort. I mean, there, there's not the standard eight hour days. Uh, when I'm really deep into a video, I just try and get it done that day. Most videos, two days for us, you know, even if it's a 25 minute video. Yep. Well, most people just don't get it. But I, I take the time and I explain it to them. But I do. Yes. Do I do I become do I get a dickish sound to me sometimes? <laughs> you don't know no. what I do. You don't know me. You know, but then then the kid comes up to you. He's like, oh, I started a, an influencer marketing company. Would you be interested in in influencing? I'm like, influencing what? Oh, we just do these things. I'm like, no, no. I find the hardest part is explaining it to older people, the older generation, what you do. Um, they just think we play on the internet and that's about it. So mm. that's really tough. I, again, I just try and say I'm in like filmmaking. Well, the other thing that happens is like, oh, can we hire you to do like an infomercial? I get like, that a no. lot too. Yeah. Like, no, what you got to understand is we are a production company, a full on production company for me, us. We make videos. We're a production company. We make videos for us, which takes up all of the time. Not There's no time to go and get trade dollars for hours. Yeah, we're for not sure. going to trade. We're not going to take your money and take away, you know, and get paid whatever and have to listen to you and do your work. Uh, that's just not how it is. That's just not how we how we operate. But anyway, that's what I said to the guy. I am a global fucking influencer. I mean, a global whatever the hell, whatever we whatever he asked me. Um <laughs> What what did he say again? He said, "Are you a micro or macro oh. influencer?" Oh yes, yes. I'm a no. I'm a glo. I'm a global influencer because it's true. I'm global. I'm global. I'm, I work at Global Gym. Hey, Stephen, how about that April Fool's fix? How many people fell for it this year? I, I don't know. I mean, it, I don't know how you fall for it when we have jokes like the Pen Fifteen Double Dash D Grip or Milf Autofocus from Canon. People are like, <laughs> I watched the whole thing and I didn't realize it was a joke until the way in. It's like, how did you get through that? penis grip <laughs> i know why steven because i'm just such a good global influencer because <laughs> because I, I just deliver i deliver it the same way that i deliver everything else i'm i'm good at delivering that and it's just really easy to write a. it's not well actually it is easy when you get to make it up and you could have a good clickbaity title that then gets people to watch the issue is sometimes you go so hard on specs like just completely make shit up from out of thin air and i'm like no that that literally can't physically be possible that specific spec like having 8k in a 24 megapixel camera or something like we try to make the specs fairly realistic and then we'll throw in like one or two just outrageous spec to see if we'll throw people yeah. off or something you know the cameras look really legit the product pages look really legit the way you deliver it especially this year that you didn't have a crazy plug like what was last year wasn't it like condoms or something no last year was preparation eight that's it <laughs> but then the year before that wasn't it like uh, trojan condoms or something yeah. But this year you actually did a photography plug. But the funny part and the subtle part was that it was about film, which yeah. you would never really promote. <laughs> so hopefully people got that. Uh, I thought that real was store. really good. Yeah. yeah. It's a real store. They actually do film process. That's where I got my four by five camera that we'll be talking about later. To throw people off even more, too, after we recorded Raw Talk last week, I threw a little insert in just saying, like, it's been a really busy week. We got a lot of really big products being announced next week. You know, stay tuned. Like, I wish I could talk about it now. So hopefully people that listen to this podcast saw that fix get posted and were like, oh, this must be like what Stephen was working on. Let me check it out. And just added a little more realness to the fakeness, you know? Yeah. I, I liked it. I think it went well. I like that we can make some stuff up every once in a while. So for those that didn't watch the April Fool's video, we basically made up three cameras, uh, three of the next cameras that we're assuming will be launched. The A12 from Sony, the Z63 from Nikon, and the Canon R1. The hard part every year is trying to make fake cameras look real. Uh, specs that don't exist make them look real. And that was my job this past week for a day and a half was to try and make all these fake cameras up. Luckily, the R1, that is almost the exact same story from last year. I saw a bunch of people be like, this is the same thing as last year. It's like, no, just the R1 was the same and the Pen15 grip. 
but everything else was brand new this year. But we did rehash the Canon R1 story. I think I just had to change like the press release date and the processor name and a couple little things here and there. But that is verbatim, like the exact same script and everything. But the A12 was new this year. And that essentially was just an A93 body. I ended up changing the A93 nameplate to the gold A1. I added the custom function buttons on the front, which most flagships have. Again, I try and make them look as realistic as possible. I truly think if an A12 came out that this is probably what it would look like if it had an integrated vertical grip. Speaking of that grip, I took the grip from the A93, but the hard part was having to take out the shadowing and the dials and make it look like it's part of the body. So there was a lot of like clone stamping and shadowing added there. And I'm not like a Photoshop expert, so I'm not the best at this stuff, but I think I made it look pretty decent. And on the back of the camera, that was tough to make with the grip since there's like a groove in it where it attaches to the camera and making it look like the screen was part of it too. That was really hard. But I think it's all about the details. And that's why I think when they watch these April Fool's fixes, they're like, this looks legit. Like the product pages, they're not that hard to make. They just take a good amount of time. But I take the actual tech spec product pages from Sony, from Canon, from uh, Nikon. They're all different. But if you go to their websites, these pages should look very similar to how they actually showcase a camera and their specs. Really, all I do is just replace all of their text with ours and then switch the cameras out. But I even swap little things like the serial numbers, the model numbers, like Sony always goes by, for example, the A93 ILCE 9M3 is the model number. And I swapped it out with ILCE 1M2, which will probably be the actual model number for the A12 when it comes out. And then I add things like new arrival or notify me when available buttons and stuff like that. So it really looks legit. But what saves me with making those fake pages is I have a little Chrome plugin that literally tells me the exact font, size, spacing, if it's semi-bold or regular, whatever. So I use everything exactly the same that the website uses. And I think that's what really sells those specific pages. Faux show. I will say people did notice the Nikon Z6 III and how it was a lot of Panasonic parts. I took the S1H, the mode dial and the record button, the threads, stuff like that. And I made that camera up. Uh, mixed in with a Z6 II and a Z8. I'm surprised at how many people noticed that, but obviously I think most Nikon users that only know Nikon wouldn't really know that that was like a Panasonic part and stuff like that. But someone did call me out that like when I put it next to the Z8, <laughs> I tried to make it look like a mini Z8 and just made it smaller. And they're like, well, the mount wasn't the same size. And I'm like, I didn't even think about that. Like little things doesn't like matter. that. Yeah. That stuff doesn't matter. I mean, it's meant to be for fun. We do that thing for fun and yep. we do it every year. And this year we didn't get a company threaten us. Like last year. I even um, mimicked Sony's typical like product tour videos when they launch a camera, you know, like the A93 and it's like showing the camera and the specs and stuff. I tried to show the the um, font on the left with the spec on the right and stuff. And I think it really looked legit. And the hard part is doing all this in a day or two. But yeah, I think uh, it was another successful April Fool's video. Yeah, we'll get ready for doing it again next year. Ugh, can't wait. Again next year. Speaking of uh, next year, I don't know when the next solar eclipse is going to be, but the current solar eclipse is going to be Monday here. Are you uh, are you going to go? Go as in like travel somewhere to really see it, like full well, totality? Yes. yes, you have to see. So totality or bust is my motto. Which, I agree. But I think you still see like 90% of it. Steven, it's not the same. What what I can tell you is in 2007, I took a ride to what? North, North Carolina, then South Carolina. And wow, did you go that we far? chased totality. Well, okay. yeah, we drove down me and my ex at the time. We stayed with our guy, our, our buddy Jeff um, at his place. And then we were so close to totality because we were at like 90%. But if you're at 90%, you're not going to see it. Huh. You're just not going to see it. And then we were like, well, shit. How do we get to to a place? Where do we even go on a map to get to totality? And so I found where the path was and I found a I was like Walmart. We will find a Walmart parking lot because that sounds like a good place to aim for. It's a big parking lot and it gives us a target. And we got there and then we ended up going across the street to a, a high school that that was doing a, a thing. And you just sat there and it was cool because you sit there. Totality starts to happen. The lights end up coming on because they're all on t uh, on <laughs> sensors, and then the 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 the, the animals start chirping. The insects, yeah, because they get yeah, all start thrown chirping, off. and then it's all so of a funny. sudden totality's gone i think it was only like a mi two minutes last time this time it's like four minutes and it's great i mean because it's running across the entire united states um from like buffalo down through 
Texas. I think it's going through Dallas. So if you live it in is. Dallas, you, you get to see it as long as you don't have major thunderstorms. Um, yeah, I saw Petapixel, I think, posted a, a map of where the actual true path is for full totality. And yeah, it really does run right down pretty much the middle of uh, America. It's a hundred mile. It's a hundred miles swarth swath of 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 an area as it just runs through. And it's about four minutes of totality for us i guess what we'd have to drive like six hours away to kind of see yeah, you got to drive past pittsburgh to cleat like cleveland is in totality it's terrible or or you go up to buffalo that area yeah that that is i mean but it's a long at you're looking at a long ass drive i oh yeah i've seen totality is it worth it is anything do i enjoy anything no no and that's why i'm like i know you're gonna say no <laughs> no i mean it's it's cool but again i don't get like it's like people going to a Taylor Swift show, like fa- fawning and falling all over themselves because they think it's the most amazing thing. I tried to watch the Taylor Swift thing on on Disney Plus. Tried to watch some of it, and I'm like, this is just three and a half hours of her on stage. I don't, I don't care. Like, I don't, I don't care. I don't need to watch this. I'm not a huge fan of watching like concerts after the fact, you know, or any live performances because I, I just, I'd rather be there you have to be there to really experience it fully just watching it i'd rather just listen to like a live album on spotify or something like that well it's like people asking me are you gonna photograph the eclipse and i'm like no i didn't photograph it in 2017 i'm not gonna photograph it now no because i didn't care everybody else can take pictures of it it's they all look the same Uh, there's nothing unique and different about it and i don't need it like can i do it yeah, because you know why? I'm a global fucking influencer. <laughs> I can do it, right? I don't need to do, do it. Do you know who I am? Right. I don't I don't need to. I don't want to. I have no desire to take those pictures personally. I was there to just watch it, and then we got in the car, and we turned around, and we started driving back home. <laughs> oh, you guys didn't even hang out. <laughs> you, you drove all that What's way to just see? to hang out for like 10 minutes and leave? Well, I mean, you had to be, it was a long way to go, and we had well, a good you night. to make a trip out of it, like stay a night or two, you know? Stay a night in in the fucking Walmart parking lot. No, what, what do I look like? To somewhere you? Someone local with no around teeth? there. There's probably something to do. No, not where we we ended up in some podunk South Carolina town that was overrun yes. by people coming to see the totality. Basically, what I did is I chose a location that I felt was not going to be a a normal location that people would gravitate towards. You know, it wasn't like one of the big cities. It was something off the beaten path, which was kind of cool to go to one of those local shitty restaurants. that was honestly really shitty that was there. But we sat at table. There were so many people that you ended up sitting at tables with other random people. And and that's that was cool. Um, that part was cool. But the whole thing of watching it, you're like, wow. Well, I mean, I said, wow. I was like, Whoa. you said, wow. I was like, wow, that's cool when it goes and disappears. And you're like. I mean, it is it is cool. Shit, I think I want to go see it. I want to go see it, Stephen. I'm going to get in the car right now and start driving. I'm surprised you weren't like, that's it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's basically it for two minutes. I mean, it's it's cool. Don't get me wrong. But what is, it's going to be about 85 or 90% here. So we just have to... You go outside and you can look with your glasses, not your like glasses i have i have these um steampunk looking uh welder's goggles that i bought last time well before we went on well before they all sold out right and i and i had these things and they look really dumb but but whatever (laughs) i was looking up at the world through these goggles Uh, i bought some super cheap amazon ones for this time around just in case i end up doing anything which i i know i won't but you never know uh and who knows if they're real or fake like you take a total chance if you buy shitty ones on amazon but again just wear two i'll layer them up i think it's like an eight pack i'll just wear all eight (laughs) yeah i mean how how bad can it be (laughs) just wear eight i don't know what they actually do they're like don't look at a eclipse why is an eclipse stronger than a than looking at the sun well i think it's just just as powerful rays but you're staring at it for like four minutes straight two minutes straight whatever it may be i think it's only full totality is where you can look at it without glasses right I don't remember. Yeah, maybe. I think. I think we took our glasses off for full totality. Yeah, it's supposed to filter out ultraviolet, infrared, and intense visible light rays. That's what the goggles are supposed to do. Hopefully, these cheap ten dollars ones do that. I'll just layer them up. <laughs> My eyes. I'm melting. blind. I'm blind. I don't. I don't. I shouldn't have looked at the eclipse. Uh, I should have bought the twenty dollars version. <laughs> no. What you do is you get one of those strainers for. Uh, vegetables or 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 spaghetti strainers and you hold that up and then it creates all of the uh you can watch on the ground as 
the shadow looks like the uh, uh the shadow you know the shadow looks like the freaking eclipse happening on the ground yeah but that's not fun no i mean it's I might pretty as well cool, just watch though. the eclipse after the fact on youtube yeah you might as well oh that was amazing <laughs> oh that was great no, i mean it's cool to cool see part is burning it, out your eyes looking at it if you're right there it's a good thing to see if yeah. you gotta go like look if you've never seen totality go see totality if you can but don't settle for 98 percent. don't settle for 99 yeah. percent. it's totality or bust you go all I the agree. way or you don't go at all that's it and i think they said the next one is what 20 years away is it really it's like 2044 or something oh, shit. in north america at least oh shit steven oh so i'm gonna take off like- monday by the way <laughs> For four minutes? You're going to go see uh, it for four minutes? I'm going to go travel uh, eight hours away for four minutes, yep. Yeah, but the problem is then there's traffic because it gets everybody's trying to get to the totality zone. Sure. So all the roads are backed up. Like, it is really a, a, a thing. It's really a thing. You got to get there. I mean, if you live in Dallas, you're already there. But let's move on. Let's move on. I um, Did you see me playing with the scanner yesterday and unscrewing the, the lid? And Oh, I, I saw the crazy amount of dust and debris you had in there. <laughs> It, don't blame me, Stephen. I don't. I, I don't know how my scanner got so much dust up and under the glass on the top. There's two. There's two layers of glass. There's top glass. There's bottom glass. Because it scans top, it scans bottom, and it's just uh, terrible. I, I don't understand. Like I have a, I have a printer, all in one machine scanner, and my glass. Same thing here. I never use it. Never lift it up. And yet I just lifted it up the other day after looking at yours and there's debris everywhere inside. It's like, how did that happen? It's plastic <laughs> it's supposed to be sealed, it, but it's not. I mean, these, I they're like, I mean, this is an Epson pro scan or V scan, uh, uh, an Epson V 850. It's like 10 years old at this point, but it's the only one that they, they don't make them anymore. Like it's the last version they make because why are they going to continue to make more? Now it does a pretty good job scanning four by five negatives, though I put them directly on the glass because the, the scanner uh, carrier that they give you cuts out the border and I want the border. I, I don't want it to just look like a regular photograph. I want to see the actual border. And so I was like, there's so much dust under here that it's really a problem. I'm going to try and, and, and clean it. So I figure out how to take it off. I, I kind of fucked it up. Um, the whole top scanner part wasn't working. I mentioned to you, I was like, you can probably just clean it, like remove it. And then I leave work right after. And I think I, you text me like, I think I messed it all up. And I'm like, I didn't realize you were going to do it right then and there. <laughs> I would have helped you out. No, there's nothing you could do. Now, the one yeah, thing but I, I knew that there probably needed to be a locking thing to lock the scanner first and then take the glass off. Yeah, there was a lock. I didn't see that lock. I didn't see the lock until yesterday when I tried to do it again. But the the bottom part works. Top part doesn't work. Uh, they still sell this, by the way. Yeah, it's still $1,300. $1,300 bucks new. Look, b and said they'd send me one anyway if, if Epson doesn't want to send me another one. It's just it's it's just disappointing that it had so much. It was like it was like. You know, someone was doing cocaine on the bottom glass, and this was the residue that they didn't snort up. That's how much was there, right in the middle of the scan area. Oh, I see the digital ice technology logo on the front, like that shitty software. We used to have that. We used to have that on like the Naritsu uh, processor that we used. It was the worst. Uh, it would do like the worst auto correction ever. Shitty HDR. I actually don't mind when I scan the four by fives and there's certain imperfections in it. I think that f- lends well to film. Agreed. It's kind of natural there. Uh, not like a massive scratch, but it, like minor a, a things. hair or something like that. Yeah, the hair I'll, I'll take out. It's unfortunate that I, I did that with the scanner. Kind of frustrating, but uh, I, I thought maybe I could clean it. Like, What's the point of having a dirty scanner? But the reason I bring this up is I've been talking for weeks about the 4x5 camera that I purchased at that retro camera store. It's called Retro Photo in Reading, PA. You've been shooting and film? I've been shooting 4x5 film, Stephen. Oh. Testing out Tell the 4x5 1940s camera, aerial camera reconnaissance lens that's radioactive and it was all gearing up to photograph baseball and the Phillies had home opener they had a second game they had a third game then they had a couple that were basically all in rain so I wasn't going to go to those so I'll tell you the day before opening day I was all anxious I didn't know like I'm like what am I going to do how's this going to work blah 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 and then then the day of the game I was like 
yeah, I'm super jazzed. Like, this is going to be great. Uh, I'm excited. This is going to be fun. I've got my 360 camera ready to film the process. I've got the Insta360 Go on my head, uh, you know, so I look like a moron. And <laughs> I just go around. Hey, you and have so no I get shame, there. though. It's great. It's, I don't need shame. I'm doing this for the people. Do you know why I'm doing it for the I know, people, but Steven? you look ridiculous in the process. <laughs> Do you know why I look ridiculous, Steven? I'm a global fucking influencer. <laughs> so you could look ridiculous if you're a global influencer. It's part of the game. You, you can. So I, uh, I was super excited. Uh, everybody's asking me questions. I'm getting set up. People are curious how it's going to work. I step out onto the field and, and the players are going to walk in from center field and I'm standing there going, what the hell am I supposed to do now? <laughs> like they're wa- I can't focus while they're walking because I have to f- just shoot 120 frames per second with AI <laughs> autofocus, Jared. <laughs> no. So what I realized what I would have would need to do in the future is you find a spot. It's called zone focusing from way back in the day is you pick like, say, the foul line and you focus on the foul line pre-focus. so that when a subject yeah. works, walks right there, you're like, click. So you're pre-focusing in that area in the hopes that someone hits it. You just got to be patient and wait for it and hope that things don't move. So I was like, this is impossible. I have to wait for things to stop moving. So for one, the Philly fanatic stopped moving. So I set up a picture with him while he was standing there during the pre-national anthem, which was America the Beautiful or whatever stupid song they were singing. And then I focused on the, the Philly fanatic. Uh, I'm like, I'm going through the process. Almost forgot to wind the shutter four times because I got to wind it four times to get to one five hundredth of a second. I had to raise my aperture to like f6.3 because of the light. So does it reset every time you take a picture, the shutter speed? Yeah, you cock it. And then when you hit the shutter, it goes back. It goes from one five hundredth. It goes back one to one twenty one one twenty fifth of a second. Hit it again. It goes to one thirtieth. Hit it again. It goes to T. And then you got to hit it again to open up the back so that you can get to the ground glass to see what you're looking at. That's a pain. So I stole a pic. I got the Philly fanatic. And then I turned and I saw Rob Thompson, the coach, on the bench. So I went over there, like closer to the the bench area, lo- had to lower the camera, had to pre-focus on him. Hopefully he doesn't move. And keep in mind, you're you're one that does not shoot with a tripod like ever. You hate tripods. Yeah, this is a totally different subject story. I, obviously you have, you to, have to. Yeah, I'm just saying like I could just imagine the frustration that you had like, oh, I got to do it quick. I got to move the tripod and I can't just real quick get on my knees and take a picture. I stayed calm. It was about you got to relax and do don't try to do too much and just just feel it. Now Remember back in the day, the field, the the sports photographers and news photographers didn't use tripods. But the difference between what I'm doing and what they're doing, what I'm attempting to do is I'm attempting to shoot a lot of the stuff at f 2.5, right? And that's super shallow. They were shooting with lenses that were six threes and seven ones. They didn't have lenses that opened up as much. They were just documenting. They were taking pictures. It didn't matter about out of focus stuff in the background. It mounted, you know, they got the news, they got the action, they got something happening. So that's why it was much easier because they could pre-focus. They knew that they had like a four foot span that was going to be in focus and they were able to, you know, flip the the, the dark slide and, and whatever and get the shot. Um, so it was a super challenge. Then for the national anthem, I knew that the players would be announced and then stand on the line. And I got like two minutes, well, minute and a half of the national anthem to try and get a shot. So I get one shot and then I know there's going to be a flyover with two jets Mm. from the New Jersey devils. They usually fly right over my house too, but I didn't see them that day. Yeah. Well, they flew over center field. Look at me. I can be center field. (laughs) So I knew they were going to come. So I, pre-focused on the line of people and it was probably at five six or six three because it was a sunny day and then i realized like there's a one of the one of the team social media people is starting to maybe venture into my frame five feet i'm like uh, fuck they got full rain right they can well yeah they can go, go anywhere rain. yeah they can go in a vin ring they can go anywhere vin rain style and then also because harper's standing there there's like a a camera guy right behind him there's a photographer down below but i'm like it doesn't matter this is the scene so i'm sitting there and you'll see this on it would obviously look better without them in the scene yeah but that i don't have a choice but i'm out there you could see it on the 360 camera when we post it that i'm waiting with my finger on the shutter uh cable release and i uh I'm waiting for the plane to fly, the planes to fly. And I'm like, okay, wait, when they get to this certain point, I think that's up in the sky. I think that's in my frame. Then I go click, flip the dark slide back, put it in and I'm done. 
and I literally shot four pictures in those 30 minutes. And you have, to this day, no idea if any of those came out, right? You I haven't don't seen have an idea. No, I haven't seen them yet, Stephen. I haven't seen them because I, I wasn't sure if I should process them myself. There were many schools of thought. My one buddy, Dan, is like, you're an asshole if you don't process them yourself, because what's the point of shooting film if you're not going to go do the entire process? I don't believe then, in that at all. And then other people that are like shooters, professional shooters, they're like, nah, man, you do what you do, which is shoot, and you drop off the negatives to be processed by someone Trust else. Trust the pros. Yeah. Well, but there's also a, a dilemma that comes with that, because then I have to drive it down to the pros. They're like, oh, you could mail it to them. And I'm like... Well, no, I'm not going to risk mailing it to them. So it's 45 minutes away in, in Wilmington, Delaware. And so I you know, have to make the decision. Do I want to drive it down? Because I got to drive down and back. That's an hour and a half. And then when they're ready, I got to drive down and back. That's an hour and a half. I could have processed the whole stuff myself. <laughs> now, I did order chemicals uh, because I did want to try it. So my friend suggested a certain chemical, which I've ended up, I, I did mix it. But the problem is that the the development time for this is like twice as long as the D76 developer. This is Ilford developer. I'm going to make some content about this so you understand the process. But for one, it was eight and a half minutes for the D76, and it was like 16 minutes of developing with this other slower Ilford developer. What is the difference? Is there a quality difference? I, I think one may be finer grain. I don't understand how that fully works. Do I think there's going to be much of a difference? The answer is no. But wouldn't that be more like the film emulsion and everything? Like... The, in terms of the grain structure and so look if the faster the hotter the temperature the faster the developing is the more grain is introduced into the negative huh. I, I know that for News a to fact me. yeah no i've known that since since way back in school and that that's what it was if your developer was too hot then you're developing much faster which means the grain for whatever reason gets a little more grainy so I'm going through this dilemma. I'm like, you know what? I've got these two modest Yahoo uh, print, uh, negatives that I took when he was here. I don't. I, yes, I care if they get ruined, but let me let me give this a shot. I spent like forever on the phone with one of these uh, uh, the retro photo, the thing that we did the April Fool's plug with. Mm -hmm. I spent an hour and, and change on the phone with the guy because he's mixing chemicals all day to develop black and white. They develop a lot of black and white film. And so he gives me the, this is how many grams you need to weigh out. And this is how hot the water needs to be. And this is what you need to do. So I did that for the fixer. And then when the fixer got to the proper temperature, like four hours later, how that I went, the fixer smells great. Ooh. And so I don't mind. The, it's sulfur, whatever. Sulfur, rotten eggs, rotten eggs totally fine. I uh, go up into our makeshift dark makeshift dark room upstairs and use my I practiced first with the with the with the, the the holder that I bought. It can do six negatives at a time, but I just did two and I went through the process and I have negatives and they worked. And it's just like, and then I was like, man, should I really be, do, should I do this myself? And then I decide, I'm like, I'm going to take it to Delaware. I drop it off at Delaware. And of course, as I'm driving home, you get the shipment of all the new chemicals that I bought because I bought <laughs> chemicals in the hopes that I'm going to do it myself. And then I'm like kicking myself because then they're like, it's going to be about a week. And now I got to wait. I answered the doorbell and it was FedEx with these B&H packages. And I'm like, I guarantee this is chemicals for Jared. And he just left to go get the film processed and developed. <laughs> He's going to be pissed off. Well, I knew off. they were coming. No, I knew they were coming. I made the decision that, you know, I want someone else to do this batch of 20. Yeah, but then when you got back, you're like, now I could just do it myself. I got all well, the I know. I'm like, I could have. But then it's just like, if I develop it and I fuck something up, it's like, damn, I should have just taken it somewhere else. So what I need to do is take some photos here and then practice in the dark room and see if I did it, which I already did. I already did a practice and I did succeed at doing it. But um, you don't know what you don't know. Like, would they process it better and develop it a certain way where, you know, what you're doing might tweak a little bit of the just the overall contrast of the image, stuff like that. You never know. No, you, you don't know. But also there is always the possibility that they fuck up and that would be terrible. Um, but I also will get to see the color negatives because I took two color negatives when I was there and We'll see what those look like because they can process those. Um, so, yeah, after the first game, I was like, this is this is going to be impossible. I don't know what I got myself into. This is terrible. What am I doing? And I felt really bummed. So did you notice uh, a lot more players looking at you this time around? Because, you know, you, you have this crazy camera set up from the 1940s. Or, or was it just like every other day where they're just ignoring every photographer on the field? 
No, I mean, Garrett Stubbs came up and talked to me, said hi. But he's like you your know. friend, though. I feel like he would say hi regardless. Well, now he does, you know, because I gave my shoot raw shirts. But no, he, he follows me on Instagram. I follow him on Instagram. And it's cool that he came up and he, you know, said hi. That we, is cool. You know, I, I, ha- I have that video as well. And I heard him um, even ask, like, how was Africa and everything? It seems like yeah. he really does actually follow you. I mean, you're a global influencer, so... <laughs> Steven, that's right. I'm a global <laughs> influencer. So I influence so many people. Uh, but but he was, um, yeah, I think people are looking. We'll see it more on the 360 camera because I'm more focused on getting the photo. And so when I went back for the third game, which was the second game that I'm going to shoot, I went with a different mindset. This game, I'm going to spend the time in the stands. I also forgot that I wanted to be on the field at the beginning of the game, you know, for the player uh, announcements and the national anthem. So I get out there and I know that Nick Castellanos is always signing autographs before games. Well, he didn't sign autographs this game. I was going to get behind him and get the picture and it was overcast. So now I was at F like 2.5. I was where I wanted to be. But Trey Turner went over to sign autographs. So I quickly got there, got down on the knee. I focused. You know, I tried to get my focus right. And then I know that my composition may not have been perfect because he may have moved uh, like a half a foot to the right. But I'm like, I know he's not going to sign forever. Put the dark slide, uh, put the carrier in, pull the dark slide. Boom. Take the picture. Reverse it. Take it out. I, I will. I will tell you, I did have uh, a few malfunctions. Oh, I bet. With two pictures. Yeah. Um, what happened? What, what when I when I went to put the dark slide back in the thing that you pull out it caught underneath the negative oh. and so when it kept it and so that bends it and pushes it into it and basically pops it out and it's ruined yeah um that happened on a shot i don't think it was one of my better shots so that's fine and then you just basically stay and you redo the shot again but that happened once during each game and it, it possibly could be the way that i loaded the film that it stuck up just a little bit and then it didn't it didn't work out perfect but i will say I did get uh, Nick Castellanos on the bench before the game, and I did get a visual in my head of how I can do it better next time. I didn't take a good angle. I'll take a better angle next time, and that's what this process is. It's a learning experience that you start. You got to start, and then you just keep building expertise the more you do it. So were there any pictures, obviously, again, you didn't get them developed yet, that really stick out to you that you took that day? Like anything specific where you're like, I can't wait to get that one shot back. I think I really nailed it. Oh, there's a couple. Or was it just kind of like, I think I did all right, but not really sure. I, I think a handful of them are going to be good because I'm a global influencer <laughs> and they're, they're bound to be good. But no, I, I there were a couple like the the airplane flying over. Right. Did I nail that or did I not nail that? Did the guy get in the way of my shot or did he not get in the way of my shot? Right. That's good. I got some at home plate where I I actually got a swing. Right. You got to anticipate because if they don't swing, you just burn the shot and it's not going to be that good. I shot inside third base, which was very difficult on the inside because I, I have a tripod and I feel like I'm getting into people's ways, which I did. And I got told that I had to move. That wasn't good. But, uh, you know, I just have to keep trying. I sat on the floor to do it. Because there are certain, you know, shooting points and, and holes you can shoot through and nets and stuff like that. Do you find yourself taking up more space and room now with a camera set up like this where, you know, you're taking up two slots instead of one? Are you getting pushback from the MLB or the Phillies about that or, or other photographers? Well, partly, yes, taking up more space, but I'm also very aware of everybody else is there to do a job. Sure. That's and what I, I mean. like yeah. to say that, like, I'm not doing a job, but then they're like, no, you actually are. You are doing something. It's different. And I'm like, I'm like, why? And they're like, because you're a global influencer. <laughs> and so, but no, I made sure that they, <laughs> but they were okay need to get the shots. You don't really need to get shots. No, but I made sure that they were fine. I'm like, hey, if you need the spot, I'll move. And they're like, no, you're good. And I'm like, OK. And so also during the early part of the season, certain games there won't be that many shooters so there's a lot more space but the second game but i went into day the is outfield. obviously a big day opening day was was busy and you know i did fine i stay i tried to stay out of the way it, it i did good but i may need to think of if the if if there's another way that i can get a smaller tripod or a smaller footprint they said sir maybe. this uh this space is reserved for the major influencers you're just a minor one so do you gotta you gotta get out of here Macro or micro? Oh, macro or micro? <laughs> macro that's or it. micro is what he said. It. Uh, you know what? I should get a shirt that says "Global Influencer" on the back. <laughs> <laughs> I have the shirt. Right? Someone got me a shirt years ago that said, "I'm big on the internet." It was before I was big on the internet, so I was actually lying. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably thought you were huge. <laughs> I probably had like five thousand subscribers. I'm and I'm big on the internet. I've got two thousand subscribers on YouTube. Look at me. 
But what happened during that other game, that the second game that I shot where I was in the outfield, it was kind of cool when I played with that tilt and pan, but I went into a handicapped area where there were no handicapable people sitting, so it was fine. I'm out of the way, my tripod's set up, and I get a tap on my shoulder. There's three security guards behind me. Unfortunately, I wasn't rolling at the time, and I turn around, and they're like, excuse me, do you have a credential to be here? I'm like, they're like, are you a global influencer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many times is that too many Did ah, I, I think that we, horse yet? yeah <laughs> um so i i turn around they're like oh do you belong and i look down at my pass and i'm like 100 percent yeah i was like oh we've we've never seen anybody shooting something like this before so we just didn't know i'm like okay thanks for asking here here's my pass now leave me alone um but no but it's actually good that they were checking certain things you know you couldn't but, bring one, just a I, camera like that in right <laughs> no how would i bring this into the stadium and set up to shoot here but they do allow for regular interchangeable lens cameras correct absolutely you are allowed yeah. to bring in any camera you just want probably no as, tripods i assume no tripods and as long as you don't interfere with other people's viewing of the game sure i saw a girl had a, a had a 70 to 200 uh f4 i think canon rf on a on a on a body sitting down by the field <laughs> imagine I bringing saw, like a 600 f4 like sitting in a regular seat and <laughs> completely well, ruining everybody's view around you <laughs> you can't you i mean i've i've done it uh <laughs> i sat in I I'm sat not in surprised. the outfield. Well, with the 1200 millimeter last year, but no, I didn't block anybody's view. And the reason was I was sitting in the in dead uh, left field where you look straight at home plate. So you're not blocking anybody's view because everybody's looking straight ahead. And so the lens was pointed straight ahead. But I was I was I'm I'm more excited to see the second batch of images than the first because I played with the tilt uh, feature in the camera and I was able to drop the ISO. Uh, sorry, drop the ISO, drop the aperture a little bit because the lighting, we had more overcast sky. Now, hopefully those exposures are good because I because I was under an overhang and I don't know if the meter is metering for everything or or if, you know, I, I just can't there was, believe that no app spot. does not have like a spot metering. It has a square. It has a square in the middle. So hopefully I, I got I it right. I assume that's like spot metering then. Right. It's not, though. It's not because if I point the picture, the, the, the camera, the phone at like a shaded area, the aperture, you know, it all changes a certain way. I, I'm, I'm going to look for another app that possibly has a spot meter. Now, I know someone sent me that there is one, but it's more of an old school style like 1950s light meters look. And I don't want that. I don't want the 1950s light meter look. I want a spot meter or I could just get a, tr a Sakonic real light. Yeah, meter I was going to say, why don't you just buy a real one? I'm surprised you of all people. I had one and I don't, I think I gave it away. I really do. I don't remember ever up. having one at the studio oh. at least. Oh, we did. It was in my, it was in my, my strobe bag that oh. I never used. Oh yeah. So the one that I had was the Sakonic L308 X. What's that run these days? $229. The Sakonic Speedmaster with digital screen is $629. Um, the, the, the high end Sakonic one is $679. It's, uh, oh, Jesus Christ. Sakonic Spectrometer C800, $1,700. Oh, I guarantee you're going to get that one. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> What's Sakonic the most C7, expensive thousand? one I can buy? Here's a, here's a $2,300 one, Steven. And a $2,400 one that comes with a bundle kit. Anyway, I, I'm excited to do it. The dilemma is still remaining on whether or not I should be processing these negatives myself uh, and scanning them being that I broke the scanner. I have to get another scanner. So we'll see if that happens. I mean, I will. I like the idea of being able to scan for reference for myself, but I do think that when I get the best of the best, a drum scanner is the best of the best way to do it. And that's like 60 bucks a pop, depending on who you go to. And back to the whole developing and processing story. Uh, I mean, I just think when you get the images back from the lab, just compare them to the modest one. See if there's really much of a difference or if it looks pretty much the same, you know. Hopefully they turn out. That's really what I'll say is hopefully they turn out. Uh, I would be very disappointed if they don't turn out and if I did something wrong. I don't think I did something wrong. I think I followed the method. I think my apertures and shutter speeds were were proper. I think you played with that camera enough beforehand. Oh, I did run into an issue. I did run into a couple of issues. One, I stepped on the field the first time and I pulled the bellows all the way out because that's what I thought I needed to do. And I lock it into place and I realize it won't focus past like 20 feet. 
it won't focus past 20 feet. It had no more room. And I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? So I tried something. I unlocked the bellows and I moved it back halfway and I locked it back in. And then I looked at the cat and I looked at the ground glass and I was like, I, f- I solved it. And that was it. I had to not extend the bellows as far and it worked. Huh. So I did that. And then another thing was when I pressed the cable release, it got locked in the down position, like locked. And I'm like, what is going on? Did oh, I break the cable It's burning through release? all my film. It's shooting 20 frames a second. I can't stop. <laughs> so I, I, I unscrew it from the front and the thing's sticking out, like the red rocket, you know, of a dog. It's like sticking out. <laughs> and then I realized that there's a switch on the plunger next to the plunger that, you, that, that came unlocked, which then locks it down. And you got to press the thing. It's a whole, it was a whole thing, but I figured it out. But I mean, that's the thing about this, this, this project and experiment is that I don't know a lot about the camera because there's not a lot to you. You got to discover this stuff. Oh yeah. Trial and error. So I'm going through all of these processes that are manual and I'm discovering things and I'm figuring out how to fix them on the fly. And now I'll share the results with you as soon as I get something that hopefully turns out. I I mean, it really makes you realize how spoiled we are with mirrorless technology these days, especially something like an A93 where it's just shooting fish in a barrel. You know, it's it's so easy these days to get a shot with the autofocus, the frames per second, everything. That was my reasoning for changing it up this year for baseball yeah. is to shoot something different because baseball becomes monotonous. And uh, I, I think it, it's it, great what you're doing. And I'm really excited to see how many really unique shots and angles you get with this film project. Yep. I'm going to travel around a little bit, see what I can capture from it, uh, see what portraits I can get. Because I think the more the players see me, the more I'll be able to. And I'm going to print out prints and give it to them. I was going to say, I think they need to see the final product and then they can see what you're getting with this and how unique these images are. And they might be lining up. up They're going to line up. Hey, (laughs) Instead of lining up for the national anthem, they're lining up to get their picture taken. Who wants a picture? (laughs) Yeah. So that's what I think is going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to print a bunch of these and I'm going to give them to the players and, and then, you know, they'll be like, wow, that's unique. And that's cool. Hopefully, hopefully everything turns out. So I will keep you guys apprised of what's happening so now moving on remember when steven said during was it, when you were talking during april fool's fix about we're working on a bunch of stuff were you referring to the lenses those chinese lenses oh, no. that we've been testing no out? i was basically hinting and joking around that i was just saying hey there's a lot of stuff we're working on right now just trying to get people like hyped up to be like oh maybe next week there's gonna be some major announcements major announcements yeah major announcements but let, let's move on to these lenses. We filmed uh, three videos yesterday we did. on what we like to call fourth party Chinese lenses. We've got stuff from Laowa, the 10 millimeter 2.8 autofocus for Nikon and for Sony. And then we did a two Viltrox, a 35.18 and a 85.18. And yeah, what what do you think, Stephen? Uh, I, I've never held them or tried them out until yesterday, pretty much. And I will say, you know, for what they offer for the price, especially the Viltroxes, the 85 1.8 full autofocus uh, for $400, you really can't beat that. And I also didn't realize how many of these quote unquote fourth party lenses, these cheap, you know, uh, how many of them there are. I looked up to see if there was any comparable lenses and there's probably another seven, eight, nine different versions of an 8518 that you can buy for the Sony E-mount. And they're all ranging from anywhere from like 250 bucks to $600, you know, until you get to like Sigma and Tamron, which we consider kind of more third party because Tamron and Sigma are almost becoming like first party native lenses, especially Sigma with their build quality these days. So that's why we're referring to these as fourth party lenses. But yeah, I was really surprised at the quality that you were getting out of these really cheap budget friendly lenses. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have to wait to watch all of the reviews, but the gist of it for me was that what I'm looking for is, is it focusing at 1.8 and nailing the eye because we have IAF? Does that work? Can it track some of the subjects and get pictures? You know, if you're shooting multiple frames, is it going to be perfect for everyone? The answer is no, but is it good enough for the price for a beginner who would, who's not going to drop $800 That's for a 35? Yeah. You're not going to drop $850 for a Nikon 35 when you can drop 379 
I think the coatings on these lenses, the actual quality of the optics are not going to be up to par of like something like a G Master lens, you know, the highest L lenses, uh, the S lenses from Nikon. Uh, I think the flaring is probably going to be tough. The chromatic aberration is not going to be great. No one cares. All of that stuff. But at the end of the day, the stuff that actually matters, like is it focusing and can it keep up and take a picture at 1.8? That's what matters. So, yeah, I wish these kind of lenses were around when I started out because I only I could buy like a 51 four or one eight the nifty 50 and that's really it until i started to get into like the l lenses but there wasn't much of an offering back then yeah for, as for i've always said like this and, and as i always say if someone's looking at your pictures and you got the shot no one's going to be like oh look at the chromatic aberration there oh look at the flaring that you got ah what yeah, like obviously if you-, if you compare it directly to a very high-end lens like i said a g master you're going to see a, a Probably a big difference, but for the most part, if you're just showing it to the the average person, they're going to be like, that's a great shot. But seriously, if you're showing it to me, it's still like, unless you're pixel peeping, a, sh- a good shot is a good shot is a good shot. You're not going to really see the differences too much. And Laowa, that lens, that is the first ever autofocus lens from Laowa. They usually just do manual. And the fact that you can get a 10 millimeter fixed prime for uh, f2.8 too on top of that for either Nikon or Sony, that's pretty awesome. But... It does come at a price at eight hundred dollars, but there's not much else out there besides like the fourteen to thirty, fourteen to twenty-four for Nikon. But like a lens like this, I would have killed for to have when I did concert photography because I couldn't ever get anything wider on Canon back in the day than like a sixteen to thirty-five. But you know, we didn't get the eleven to twenty-four until what was that, twenty sixteen? So before then, I was I could only shoot at sixteen. And concerts, you really have to go ultra wide for some shots. Well, Stephen, I was shooting at 10 and a half millimeters back in the day, and I also had a 16 well, millimeter fisheye back in the day. I would cheat it, and I had a circular 8 millimeter fisheye from Sigma that was a piece of crap. Fourth party. But I would just crop in and transform it in post to make it look like a normal rectilinear ultra wide shot. But I had to make sure the subject was completely in the center of the frame because everything else was super soft when you would transform it, obviously. Like you're just stretching it. Let me say this, and this is like. This isn't bashing a a camera company or anything, but being that I used two Viltrox lenses, one on a Nikon, one on a Sony, I really felt that that 85 on the Sony focused better and acquired better than when I used the 35 Viltrox, which I'm assuming is using the same algorithms when it comes to to their autofocus um, on the Nikon. I just felt more struggly on the Nikon side than I did with the lens on the Sony side. It just felt more critical sharp, critically sharp with the Sony front. Now, that's not matching an 85 on the on the Nikon side, but it's just even using the Laowa lens, the, the 10 millimeter, still have that same thing where it feels like it struggles more on there than it did on the, ca- uh, on the Sony. And that's just an observation. That's that's you know, it's funny, Stephen. What? You know, I'm a global influencer and people forget the fact, not even forget the fact, but, you know, need to realize that we have used every camera for the last 14 years, basically, that's ever been put on every camera that's been put on the market with almost every single lens. So there's very few people in this Certain world. Certain brands, that's not true, but go well, on. Well, I'm not talking, I'm talking Nikon, Canon, Sony yeah, right now. The big and that's, of course, not 14 years for the last 14 years for, for Sony, but People need to, to to realize that there's very few people, photographers, that have used every single system as extensively as you and I have used those systems. And the, the reason I say that is I'm running into these sports shooters at the Phillies now who have switched over to using A93s and they're like, it's night and day autofocus between the A1 and the A93. See, that's they are surprising. Now saying, wow. Well, but but it's 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 because it's it's got the acquisition. It actually finds a subject. The new processor with the new subject right. detection. Yeah. And I go, do you guys now see what I've been saying for the last bunch of years about the Canon system? Whether it was the R five, the R six, the R six Mark two, the R three, these the focusing systems in these things already were doing this, and it took them to get there with the A nine three. You guys thought you had great autofocus. You did. And now you see it. That's the I thing is it. Canon has always had the head detection, the torso detection, the actual full on subject detection. So when the subject would turn, it would still stay locked on their head where Sony would 
change into that like 3D tracking mode, the lock on tracking when it would turn and still lock on the head, but it wouldn't really detect that that was a human being. And now with that new uh, AI processor from the uh, A7R5 that is now in the A93, it is fully detecting everything. The difference is that Sony markets it as, again, a dedicated AI processor where Canon just calls it uh, their digit X processor. And that's yeah. it. You know, they, they yep. should have had more hype around it, to be honest, but they really didn't. No, but it, it just it just works really well, which leads us into the last thing to talk about this week is uh, Canon's got to be ready to drop the R1 and the R5 Mark II. They got to be. And and uh, Canon Rumors has been saying that May, it's going to be May when the R5 Mark II gets released. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it better come soon because uh, they're probably working on the A12, the Z92, all of that. And this is a critical moment for Canon again. Will this be another 5D Mark IV moment where it's barely an update or an upgrade? Or will they hit it out of the park like the R6, R5? Yeah, it, you know, going back to that that 5D Mark IV from the 5D Mark III, the 5D Mark III was fantastic. And the, the 5D Mark III got, was great because it, it basically combined the 7D with the 5D Mark II and made it into the 5D Mark III with the faster focusing, faster frame rate, faster everything. Uh, but yeah, the 5D Mark IV was such an incremental update that it was already outdated right off the bat. There were just minor things that they could have done that would have made it better. And just one of those was taking out the compact flash card. By the way, but, I want to buy a 5D Mark IV. Yeah, anybody want to want to do that before more fun to photographer cameras come in? Uh. <laughs> Which we'll talk about when those cameras do come in, but more fun to photographer stuff is on the way. Um, so uh, if you didn't check out what I did recently, go on Instagram. A couple posts back, I, I did fund a photo. I did get another photographer a, a 1DX Mark II, and we did. I I filmed it with a uh, with a camera, and someone was taking pictures of me, and uh, we'll get that cut up and posted at some point. But um, yeah, just wanted to, like giving someone who was deserving of it and and, and just upgrading their gear is kind of cool. Um, but the, the, the R5 Mark II doesn't have a lot of place to go to, to make it even better. Like, that's the thing. I think the difference between the, the 5D Mark III and the 5D Mark IV, I mean, it was going to be incremental. There wasn't much they could change there. And with the this, it was like, do you go with a new sensor? Do you, uh, what do you make better, right? You update the autofocus. What can you do to make this camera better than what it already is? I just think they really need to give it their all. But at the same time, how do they differentiate it from the R1? You know, they still need to give it a ton, but make the R1 better at the same time. Actually, yeah, I mean, you talk about the the Z9 and the Z8 are like the Z8 is like an R5 in that well, line the Z8 of the is R5. literally a Z9 just in a different right. body. But so, I, I, I can't see Canon doing that and I'd be very shocked. The difference also is that the Z8 came out a year later. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of sports shooters are still using the R5 and they love it, partly because they have the crop option cuz it's 45 megapixels, but they love using that camera. So, it, it, and, and you can shoot it with the without the uh, well it doesn't have a mirror but you could shoot it uh, electronically and still get very good results i think if they update the sensor it's going to be an even faster readout speed i don't know if they will go to a stack sensor because then what happens with the r3 line is that just a once one and done r3 but the r1 they got to throw the kitchen sink at it they do it's got to be it's got to be one of those massive updates this is a new sense like you know what the, the, I mean, the killer... it's got to be an A93 moment for them. Global shutter, 120 frames per second, pre-shooting, all of that. I don't think it needs to be global no, shutter. No, no. I, I don't think they're going to do that, but it needs to make a big splash like the A93 okay. in terms of yeah. marketing and stuff like that. I think they're going to have some kind of sensor tech that's going to be that's going to mimic a global shutter in terms of how fast the readout is, but it will still be a traditional CMOS stack sensor uh, not hindering on the dynamic range and the high ISO capability. I think, and, and and this is talking a lot of the sports shooters would love like a 33 megapixel camera again. I think 33 is great because it's such what a nice sweet spot because you can still do 8K on top of that. Wasn't the R 33 meg? It, the R had the same pro, the same sensor as the uh, 5D, 5D Mark, Mark IV. IV. Pretty sure it was 33, yeah. You're right. So if they can do a 33 stacked, great high ISO capability, great autofocus, really good video features, pre-shooting... Uh, you know, pre pre capture those things. That newer autofocus, you know, with that MILF MIL, mil uh, <laughs> what's it what's it called? What's MILF? Uh, multi integrated live autofocus or no multi integrated live focusing system. 
Yeah, MILF, milf for uh, short. <laughs> MILF for short. If they can put that in there. Oh, you know what? The EOSR was 30 megapixels, not 33, but close enough. Oh, still, it, it, any, you know, t- I, I'm happy with 24. 30 is going to be, 30 yeah, would but be again, great. I, I, I like, the reason I say 33 is so you, the fact that you can still do uh, UHD 8K. Yeah, well, I think 30, I think, let's see, let's, let's say this thing's going to be 33 megapixels and just be a stunner. It has to be a stunner. Um, but also, I think there will be some disappointment because it's taken so long. It's taken a while to get a flagship out. But then when you start using it, you're going to be like, I don't know what else they could have done better at this point. I just think that's what it's going to end up being. I also think they can't just catch up with the competition. I think they need to do more and introduce some new technology and really make a big splash. I, I still think they're they're ahead in some ways, I mean, even we'll though, see. you know, because we'll see then again, they might be ahead for a few months and then an A12 gets announced and who knows what that's going to be. Or I, Z9 don't think Nikon, I don't think Nikon is anywhere near putting out another camera. I don't think Nikon has the ability to replace their Z9 right now uh, with their Z8. The Z9 came out in October of 2021. So it's two and a half years old. Yeah, they're not replacing that thing for at least two years. At least two years. You're saying it'll, it'll be four and a half years until a new... Yes. Yes. And I in, unless they decide to do like an A9... Sorry, a Z9S or something where it's just minor incremental updates. Well, why don't they just release new firmware 6.0 and then, then, then they can call it a, a new camera. But I don't think they can. I just don't think they will update now, it anytime soon. The A1, on the other hand, is three and a half years old. Yeah. So that is getting... F- fairly long in the tooth and that update cycle is probably ready yeah that one's probably ready to come but i don't know what that thing's going to bring even if they decide to go that direction i'm curious cool. it's going to be a really interesting 2024 with all these new cameras i think yeah. it's going to be a big year for canon hopefully uh, i think we're going to see new flagships from sony and i don't know what nikon's going to bring i mean the z6 uh, i think that hopefully will make a big splash for them too uh, but big year what about panasonic yeah who knows I honestly don't know a ton about Panasonic, so I can't really comment. Well, we 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 had a conversation recently to start getting some Panasonic stuff in again because they are one of the only L mount cameras that exists that isn't a Leica. I mean, they they are the other one, right? And so we always get asked by Sigma, "Do you want a L mount? Do you, whatever." And so I would like to start getting some of those L mount lenses in, and I, that means I need an L mount camera that's capable of doing that. And after talking to Panasonic and getting an understanding of where their mindset is, they're not like, we want to challenge everybody on shooting at 30 frames a second when it comes to stills. They're focused heavily on what they do great, which is the video side of it. And so it'll be interesting to see how can they progress in an industry that is taken up by Canon uh, in the in the in the consumer market? Because Panasonic has a pro line that's you know that people still use, and oh, they yeah. always had. Mm-hmm. They've always had those P two cards and all that stuff back in the day. But what are they bringing out? Because they want to challenge the consumer end when it comes to video. And I need to get educated on the product to you know get it in hands, learn it, and see what they can do. I mean, they did a great job with the uh, the S5 II. And then with Nikon, speaking of video, like I'm really curious with that Red acquisition, what that's going to bring to the line. I think that's still going to be many years away, though. Uh, will they have a separate cinema division now with uh, incorporating Red technology, or will they just incorporate it into their regular hybrid stills cameras? Yep. All right, Stephen, we should wrap McRapperson this thing up right now, because do you know why? Because you're a global influencer and have a no, ton of work buy, to do. I'm going to go buy my sixth property. I'm just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> I could have uh, I could have gotten you with that one. Such a douchey thing to say. What? I could have gotten and be like, Stephen, I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually uh, looking at another property I didn't tell you about. We're going to move the studio. I do. <laughs> Nothing surprises me anymore, man. <laughs> I, I've been through that like two or three times now. So <laughs> yeah, just counting down the days until the next one. I usually don't tell you. No, you don't tell me. It's almost like, been wait, a year. What? <laughs> It's almost been a year. When did I buy this? The end of May? Uh, yeah. It, it, no. May yeah, is yeah. when you actually got it, but we didn't move in until like the week my daughter August. was born. So it was August. Like yeah. August. Yeah. No, I remember because I was in Paris this time last year. I was in Paris this time last year because, again, I'm a global influencer. And so I was there. I remember because you got it in May. And then I remember thinking like, we had all this time to move in and we're going to move in the week before my daughter's born. <laughs> but uh, anyway, guys, uh, this is episode number uh, 96. 
at this point of Raw Talk. Uh, if you're listening on the YouTube and you did this last week, thank you for leaving comments to say that you went over there to listen. Not listen, but you went over there to comment. If you really want to leave a comment and you listen to the podcast anywhere else other than YouTube, the one of the best places to do that is leave the comment over on YouTube. But then that's going to hurt our view time because then it's going to whatever. I don't care about that. Uh, the other good place is 313-710-9729 as you text us on the Texty McTexterson line. And leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It's been a minute since we've said that. Hey, how are those looking these days? I don't know. I haven't really looked. But anyone uh, over on YouTube who is watching this for the first time, uh, if you like it and enjoy it, please give us a uh, five star rating and tell us what you think. Yes. So let's just say like next week, Stephen, the Phillies get back on Thursday with home games. Let's see. They play Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I think it's like Friday, nine games Saturday, in a row, right? Sunday. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten games. Ten. <laughs> ten games in 11 days at home. Wow. So, so what would be good with the four by five thing is. I got to ask the guy who does the developing if he lives in Philly, because my buddy Steve told me that he used to drop off his film to the guy who did the processing, name the same guy that does the processing in Delaware, that if I could just drop it to him every day, it would be easier because he wouldn't have to change his chemicals out. So it would be more efficient for him that if I could just meet him and drop it off to him after each game, you know, maybe not at the end of the game, but the next day before he leaves for work. Yeah, that'd be that great. That way... But that way, he wouldn't have to, like, because he doesn't want me to hold to have 60 negatives at once that he has to do because he'd be there developing forever. So if I take, like, 10, 15 during a game, I could give it to him the next day and he could take it down and he can do the processing or, or I could do the processing. So let's wrap it up, Stephen. Let's do it. All right, guys. Thank you very much for listening. Jared Polenfrono's photo.com. See ya. Bye.